Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Over 2,000 delegates from across China will attend the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, which is to be held in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. What decisions will be made at this monumental meeting and how will the party overcome the challenges at home and abroad? To find out more in the first half of the program, I'm glad to be joined by Zun Ahmad Khan, Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. In the second half, I will also be joined by Tarek El Sonoti, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Egypt's El Aram newspaper. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingdu. Welcome back. Now we have Zun. Zun, welcome to the discussion. Uh, you are one of the youth representatives of the Global Young Leaders Dialogue, uh, who wrote a letter to President Xi last year. In his response to your letter, Xi wrote how he appreciated your active visits around China to deepen your understanding of the country. Uh, tell us more about the background and also, of course, the letter from Mr. Xi. Thank you, firstly, for having me on the show, Chindu. I think uh, definitely this letter, which we received last year from President Xi, uh, we, the Global Young Leaders Dialogue, as you mentioned, is a platform. And this platform allowed us, first of all, last year, uh, many of us to visit different parts of China, to recognize the, the developments of China that we always appreciate. We were able to see how those happened by having these visits to many parts of uh, the provinces that we visited, for instance, villages, farms. We saw how, you know, rural development is happening. We saw how ordinary Chinese people are engaged on the front lines, making everything possible. This was truly inspiring, moving, and I would say transformative. So that's when we came together after these visits and after this exposure to write a letter to appreciate and to talk about how really, as young people from diverse places across the world, we shared this experience and we know what a shared future can be if we decide to embrace our diversity and move towards the same goal. And that's when, you know, this letter, when we received the response, actually, it was uh, it was the most, I think it was the huge, the most uh, significant moment of our life so far. Obviously, uh, this kind of recognition coming from President Xi, who has, with example, exhibited how can such a big 1.4 billion people be moved in, in a positive direction and has always encouraged young people. Mm -hmm. And I'll quote quickly in the letter where, he's, uh, where he writes, youth is a time for aspirations. And having just passed the centenary mark um, uh, an arduous journey and being at a new height of its life, the Communist Party of China remains true to its original aspiration. And that aspiration is people we can see it, numbers say it, and we could feel it. People are really spearheading on the front lines, making development possible. And I'll also mention where he said that young people globally must unite. So this is a letter, but it was a letter for us, but for young people across the world to embrace our diversity and to move forward with unity and a shared vision. So there's a lot of hope for the young generation, the young people around the world, not only from your group, right? I believe so. I think, you know, when we, you know, in, in many parts of the world and globally, we are seeing rising polarization. But when we have those conversations with young people from all parts of the world, those who realize that our progress as a global community is shared, there is so much hope. I think, Chindu, I'll also add that this is a generation that is privileged. We are lucky that we have the kind of access to global perspectives as we do. And with that comes a sense of responsibility. So young people, we realize that to preserve our past, to make the best of our present and to have a bright future, we have to work together. SDGs unite us. And China has done the absolute most to make the SDG vision realized uh, in, in today's world. So we have a lot to learn from China and from each other. Yeah, very important uh, development there. Uh, well, Zun, we know that, that you have lived in China since 2015, you know, with your primary research on China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so what are your observations of China's development, you know, during your more than seven years of a stay, uh, you know, socially, economically here in China? Uh, so obviously, uh, 2015, what brought me to China was how increasingly engaged China was becoming with the world. I think um, still as a young researcher and journalist in Pakistan at that time, I was interested in the Belt and Road. 
because it talked about the common values that we, especially in the global south, want to move forward with. And in these seven years, I think there's so much. One of the first things I noticed was how, first of all, it was so developed and fast-paced when I came to Beijing, but it was increasingly, um, every few weeks, every few months, you would see new changes. You go to cities, I remember going to Wuhan in 2016, the skyline was filled with cranes. And today, that has become skyscrapers. I mean, this is just the pace that I noticed all of a sudden. But if I have to say one thing, you know, obviously, first of all, we saw rural development and revitalization happening. I was lucky to experience more of that towards 2019 to 2022 this year in person because we have more platforms and more opportunities to witness that. And the other change is climate change. Uh, it's not just because I come from Pakistan and this is a big issue for us, but you see how fast uh, the weather in Beijing and major cities has transformed because the priorities have been set, because the right policies have been put in place, and because growth comes with a mindset of greener and sustainable ways forward. And I see the immense mindset shift uh, among young Chinese people also who talk about climate change, who are passionate about it, and who are passionate about helping other developing countries move forward, uh, make more jobs, create jobs, create uh, economic opportunities, but let's all do it in a way that is sustainable and environmentally friendly. So I think um, some of the changes, obviously, um, the, the, massive, the massive developments we have seen, progress in second, third tier cities and villages, and climate change as a priority. Mm -hmm. Well, very impressive uh, changes over there. Well, you once, uh, you once gave an interview where you talked about a Pakistani female tractor driver in the Chinese invested project, a topic that has uh, caused a lot of discussion. Tell us about this project and why it has initiated so much conversation there. It obviously is. So um, her name is Nusrat Bai. And I think for me and for millions of women, if not more, she is a hero. So Nusrat Bai comes from a lower, like middle class region uh, in Pakistan in Thar coal, near Thar coal mines. And she has become a tractor driver under a Chinese project, and that has transformed her life. Now think about this, that Pakistan is still a country that is, we have a lot to achieve when it comes to women empowerment, women's development, and women's participation in the workforce. So when people saw under CPEC projects, women, in parts of Pakistan that couldn't even fathom them going in public places are now driving trucks. This is a massive mindset shift as well. So Nusad Bai and there are various other examples as well. I'll tell you, for instance, in uh, Gwadar and in other projects under CPEC, because the environment is welcome, open to women, it's helping families shift their mindsets. Many parents in Pakistan and developing countries want their daughters to get a good education, to have independent lives, to have the ability to you know, work and pro progress as individuals as well. But they don't find that environment. So what we saw, Nusrat Bai becomes that example out of uh, it, uh, among the CPEC projects that are literally transforming and shifting mindsets and helping more women uh, become you know, the frontliners, become the ones who are taking Pakistan's development forward. So she is obviously an example, and it made headlines because it's such a powerful, manly, it seems to be a manly thing to do. But women can do it equally well, and we are ready to have those shifts. And she, she is setting the right, uh, the right precedent for other girls to think about, we can change our circumstances, we have the ability. Mm -hmm. a powerful example, exactly. Powerful. What's the public response to her story? Like, oh, now you know, she's uh, making history, basically, by becoming... Uh, you know, female tractor driver. That's something, you know, people probably haven't seen in that country. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll add something here. So people responded very positively. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, my view is that, you know, um, when Pakistanis, of course, as a Chinese, you would know, and I just, as a Pakistani, I know we are both here, very close, like each other on a personal people-to-people -people level. Mm -hmm. And Pakistani people know that China is... Uh, society with history, heritage, family values, and yet Chinese women are, you know, uh, basically engaged, participating in the workforce and the development of the country so significantly. It's, it's, it's a model for us. So many Pakistanis would think, okay, if our women are working, are studying more, maybe 
this will affect the family values. But you see in China that hasn't, China still a society that uh, values the family uh, as, as a unit. And that's very, uh, you know, uh, in a way, uh, people uh, care about their history. And it's also relatively conservative in the good ways, a society. So I think in Pakistan, generally, that's a positive perception about China. And then when they see in Chinese projects, our women are able to make the kind of impact that uh, maybe in the most developed countries people are seeking, it was very positive. Uh, people in all political parties uh, appreciated it highlighted her story and people in rural areas also predominantly the views that have come out were extremely positive and encouraging that we are ready to make those changes yeah very encouraging story over there uh stick to the th same theme you know the empowerment of women uh mm -hmm. Zun, you once interviewed Zhang Mei, uh mm -hmm. you know a uh, people hero a hero let's say uh, mm -hmm. she's a principal of a girls high school uh in southwestern part of china uh, you visit the school as well, uh, you know, by yourself, uh, which impress you, uh, impressed you, of course, a lot. So how do you view China's efforts in promoting the, uh, you know, female education, female employment and engagement into society? Uh, numbers speak for themselves. You know, um, I think one of the first things that I noticed when I, when I landed here in August 2015 was that women are confident, they are out, they're out in the workforce, uh, whether it's in the highest, you know, you talk about real estate and media, or you talk about even factories and all, all uh, in all tiers across society, I saw that women are actively participating. But we all know that women's imp uh, overall improvement, improvement of circumstances for women is an ongoing journey for all parts of the world. And I think China has achieved so much and when I was, I was so privileged, it was one of the most moving uh, moments of my life to see her, what, what, a, what an inspiring human being she is. And in her capacity, she was able to go to those parts of China where still mindset shifts need to be improved, right? Uh, uh, I remember she mentioned that because it's a mountainous area, some parents are still worried what good will education bring them. So personally, she would go to parents and talk to them and convince them and make them realize that it is going to make a positive impact. And that is an example of the kind of people it takes, individuals it takes to be able to inspire change. So I think when I saw Chang Wei Mei, it made me realize, of course, that people like her, she is an example. It's people like her on the front lines who are making changes in China and across the world possible. And China has already achieved so much, but still people recognize we can still do more. And I think it's all about, in the end, any country, it's the trajectory. It doesn't matter where we stand so much. China is already way ahead and is an example. But even for countries like Pakistan, if we are making the right progress, let's look at China, let's look at uh, examples heroes like Chang Guimei and think about how more of our people on the front lines can become part of the change we seek. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Zun, you have been studying uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, no. So in your observation, how has the BRI and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPAC, uh, mm -hmm. impacted Pakistan? You know, what, what kind of uh, real results have you seen on the ground as a result of this cooperation? So actually, the first step th that uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor achieved for Pakistan was that it allowed us to move forward on the basic fundamentals that Pakistan desperately needed and other countries and global institutions were not stepping in to help us with. And then on, I think what has happened over these years is, of course, we have thousands of kilometers of new infrastructure, transport infrastructure, our energy capacity has improved. We are developing special economic zones at a pace that was not imaginable years ago. And the port of Gwadar is operating. And obviously, more than 100,000 people are employed directly and also indirectly through these projects. Public transport has improved and etc. So these are some key core tangible developments. But I think what CPEC and the Belt and Road is helping countries like Pakistan understand is that you cannot uh, divorce economic and social impact. They are interconnected. Let's think of the success of CPEC and overall for developing countries, the success of Belt and Road from the perspective of people. How many people are we positively impacting? Because if we want to meet our goals in terms of education, health, 
poverty alleviation, agriculture, technology, all of these are parts of CPEC. And when we conceive projects, like all of the technical meetings, coordination meetings happening between China and Pakistan, the perspective is how much, how many lives can this positively impact? How sustainable is the development that we are currently planning? And I think that mindset shift is absolutely um, uh, transformative for countries like Pakistan. That's the end of the first half of our show. Previously, I also spoke with Tariq El Sonoti, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Egypt's El Aram newspaper on the 20th National Congress of the CPC. Let's take a look. Democracy in, in, uh, in uh, different places is also different from country to country, from place to place. It depends uh, cultures, uh, situations, uh, uh, economic in, the, in this country. You have been to Xinjiang for many times. What's your observation? Western media or Western officials from time to time, especially from the United States, they said no, there is no human rights uh, in, in this area and the, the, the Chinese authority make uh, pressure more for the poor Muslims and others. It's, it's, it's not true, it's totally fake. Well, Tarek, welcome to the discussion. Uh, some say that in order to understand the strategy of China's modernization, and indeed its future development, one needs to understand China's leadership, the Communist Party of China. So tell us just how important is this meeting? Um, thank you so much for you and for your audience to give me this uh, uh, a good opportunity to speak about this uh, very uh, important event. As a CBC uh, 20th uh, Congress meeting in China, uh, it's uh, a very important event in and out. It's, uh, it means in, in inside China, all uh, Chinese people uh, are witness this uh, event for many reasons. First, it, says, uh, it will draw the future of China and also it will put the strategy of development in China uh, this next uh, five years, maybe more than uh, five years. Uh, this party is considered one of the most important parties in all over the world for what uh, achieved in the uh, last uh, uh, decade and uh, the future and uh, the present. So the, this Congress meeting is very important for not and for Chinese people also, but all, uh, also for the outside in uh, China. Uh, well, you know, China has uh, put forward this concept of a whole process, people's democracy uh, inside China. You know, but democracy is so stereotyped in the, in the West that some Western observers would find it hard to understand the Chinese idea. Uh, so what's your observation, you know, the Chinese style democracy versus the Western model? Uh, you know, in fact, when we speak about the uh, democracy, we should say it first, uh, democracy in, in, uh, in uh, different places, it's also different from country to country, from place to place, it depends uh, cultures, uh, situations, uh, uh, economic in, the, in this country. In my point of view, democracy, it means how can to uh, put the, the ordinary people and the common people to make progress, to save for them a very uh, good uh, life, for uh, uh, infrastructures, for houses, for everything to more and more make the people in uh, progress. Uh, democracy, it means the common people can share for this idea and they can share for what the CBC or what the main party in China looking for to do in, uh, in the uh, future. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, the Western media and also the government, some of them have accused <coughs> China of, uh, you know, human rights violations against ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. You have been to Xinjiang for many times. What's your observation? Xinjiang, Xinjiang is a very important uh, province in China. It's uh, uh, west 
uh, in China, and uh, at the same time, this is a focal point of uh, the Belt and Road. When I visit it, I touch it more and more development from time to time. Uh, I visit it uh, start from uh, 2013, and after this 2017 and 2019, the last visit for me. So it's totally different. And when we speak about the human rights in this area and this in other area in China and what we, 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 we receive from uh, Western, com Western media or for Western officials from time to time, especially from the United States, they said, no, there is no human rights uh, in, in this area and the, the, the Chinese authority make a pressure more for the Uyghur Muslims and others. It's, it's, it's not true, it's totally fake. So human rights in Xinjiang, in my point of view, is, it's like uh, you can find it in Beijing, in other places in China, there is no any difference between the people and the people uh, 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 feel is a, a, a central government in Beijing and, uh, and the CBC is, lo are, is looking for uh, how to make more and more progress and development in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. So the people there is looking for this Congress meeting also is very important and is very helpful for everyone there. Mm -hmm. Well, on poverty alleviation, you know, uh, you said Arab countries are also facing the challenge of a poverty alleviation and China's successful story, uh, the experience can be of worthy reference. Tell us more about that. Uh, in fact, China achieved a very big uh, uh, achievements in this field to find uh, the way to finish the poverty in all over the world, the Chinese mainland. It's a very uh, uh, huge and excellent achievement for uh, CBC and for the uh, Chinese people also. And this is a very, very good experience. Can share it with uh, uh, Arab countries, with African countries, because uh, we have more and more similarization with the Chinese. We have uh, uh, agriculture area, and we have rural area, and we have also uh, 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 Chinese a very strategic relation with uh, China and Arab countries. We throw the uh, Chinese. China Arab forums and also the, the relation, the very uh, excellent relation between China and African countries through Africa uh, China forum. So China opened uh, all doors for to cooperate with, uh, for cooperation with other countries in this, uh, to share this experience in to fighting, uh, to fight poverty and to uh, uh, make more progress in different countries. Mm -hmm. Well, in April, uh, construction began of a vaccine cold storage facility in uh, Giza, Egypt, uh, to greatly boost the country's vaccine storage capacity. You know, with the support uh, from China's uh, biopharmaceutical company, uh, Sanovac, the facility covers an area of uh, 2,800 square meters and can store 150 million doses. Uh, making it the largest vaccine storage center in Africa. You know. How will this facility help uh, Egypt in terms of uh, vaccinating its population? And then what does it say about you know, China-Egypt cooperation? Um, in fact, we can say the, uh, the cooperation between Egypt and China in, uh, in, uh, in fighting COVID-19, it's a model for different countries. When uh, the COVID-19 started in, uh, 20, in January 2020, Egypt, is, Egypt sent some uh, uh, more and more help to China. And uh, after this, China started to uh, send uh, more help to Egypt and more cooperation with Egypt in medics and others. And uh, uh, after this, China developed this uh, cooperation with Egypt and, uh, and made here uh, uh, a vaccination Sinovac. It's one of the most important vaccination for uh, COVID-19 and uh, Egypt started to 
export this work to African countries and this uh, as uh, help uh, this uh, vaccine uh, helped Egypt more and more to save the vaccinations to uh, all uh, Egyptians in different uh, provinces, especially in rural area. So Sinovac now is, uh, is a main vaccination in Egypt now. And uh, mm -hmm. so this cooperation between Egypt and China in, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, fighting COVID-19, it's a model for is a good cooperation between uh, China and Egypt and uh, as a model for uh, uh, other countries can do the same way or to take the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, speak of the relationship between the two countries, here's a related uh, question, let's say. You know, according to a Nikkei Asia report, and the loan recipients of China and the Belt and Road Initiative, such as Sri Lanka, your country, Egypt and Ghana, uh, found themselves strapped for cash you know, after the COVID-19 pandemic and also um, because of the hiking of interest in the U.S., you do see a soaring global inflation. So the report added that you know, an estimated 60% of China's loans are now owned by nations in debt crisis. How is Egypt dealing with this crisis? And also, do you think it's fair to blame, you know, to put the blame on China? In fact, it's a very important issue because uh, from time to time we received some reports from Western, especially from the United States, they said that China wants to make more and more pressure for African countries and uh, for Egypt and for others with uh, loans and with uh, 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 this uh, money from came from China to these countries and uh, in my point of view is is not uh, correct and I'm totally disagree with these reports because China in fact tries to help these countries especially in Africa and Egypt to give them some uh, big projects in infrastructure and others but uh, what uh, the came what the main uh, purpose for this uh, points from time to time came from Western. It, it's a big pressure. Uh, uh, United States and Western, some Western countries wanted to put in uh, China and make some uh, troubles between China and uh, uh, other countries, especially in Africa. This uh, uh, cooperation as uh, uh, a counterpart uh, partnership with these countries based on a win-win situation for every country is not uh, uh, only for China but for other countries at the same time. So uh, the Chinese policy and the other countries policy can look to the, its interests and also can to deal with this issue uh, from uh, their points of view, not from uh, other countries' uh, points of view. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to Tarek El Sonoti, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Egypt's El Aharam newspaper. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Kim Chindo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.